Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's research conference. We have a, a real special guest uh, from across the campus, which is, um, which is very nice to have, Dr. Um, Broom, uh, who is a professor and dean of the School of Nursing here at Duke University. She's also vice chancellor for nursing affairs at Duke University, as well as associate vice president for academic affairs for nursing at Duke University Health System. She has a long and distinguished career, um, a wide range of research interests, but one of the cores is a, um, a field that actually touches all of us in engaged in clinical research and particularly important for challenging situations like in pediatrics. So we'll hear about research ethics um, from an internationally recognized expert. Prior to joining Duke, Dr. Broom was dean of the Indiana University School of Nursing, where she was awarded the rank of distinguished professor. She's widely regarded as an expert, scholar, and leader in pediatric nursing research and practice, as well as researcher uh, in the ethics of informed consent, as well as assent for children in research, research misconduct in trials, um, as well as ethical dilemmas in publishing. Currently, she is editor-in-chief of Nursing Outlook, the official journal, journal of the American Academy of Nursing, as well as uh, the Council of the Advancement of Nursing Science. Um, she's got a long list of awards and accolades, uh, and it's a real pleasure to welcome here today. Please join me Thank in you. welcoming Dr. Broom. Thanks. Thank you. Everybody sits towards, on this side, sits towards the back, right? Um, this is a topic that I, um, I was a very active researcher with um, funding from NIH for many years studying actually pediatric pain models and interventions. And then with all that work, especially in pediatrics, um, all kinds of ethical, you know, issues came up and sort of got me very interested, especially in the informed consent ascent. And I had the um, honor of being uh, one of the 14 projects that was funded by NIH back in the early 2000s looking at um, research ethics. And the beauty of that was I think it was one of the first times that NIH actually brought people from all different fields with R01s together so that we, four of us were studying different aspects of pediatric research and others were studying dementia. Um, and dementia populations and other vulnerable populations. And so we got together once a year. And I tell you, that's an amazing opportunity to learn from other scientists across the country um, and really get some synergy uh, going. And then right after that, an RFA fell in. Uh, as we were doing that work, sort of we, I don't know, tripped over some kind of uncomfortable situations um, in pediatric clinical trials that when an RFA came out around scientific misconduct, um, we were funded to study, uh, ex um, do a national survey of scientific misconduct, uh, revising, actually research integrity, revising an established tool. But then we were able to interview 300 research coordinators. And if there's any group that knows really what's up, it's those research coordinators. Um, and so that's sort of, we developed a tool to measure scientific misconduct, and um, that's been published, and uh, you'll see some of the citations, and actually is still used, especially in international venues now. I get a lot of requests for that tool. So what I'll talk about here, though, is um, the role of the researcher as one of the, what I call stewards of knowledge in, the, in any profession. Um, and the, what I think the cycle of moral responsibility and research integrity is from the very conception of an idea all the way through dissemination. And I'm actually, one thing I've observed at Duke that kind of surprises me, um, but I've only been here for eight months, is that people seemed um, unusually concerned that their ideas will get hijacked. I've not had that experience before. Um, at least I didn't hear about it at IU. And I say to people, why would you, why would you worry about that? And um, <laughs> they tell me some interesting stories. Um, so that's why I added the idea conception. Uh, continuum of mis scientific misconduct. There's some, been some fascinating literature about, uh, about that. And then strategies to align your research conduct with common ethical principles. Uh, and there's the, you know, ORI, the Office of Research Integrity at NIH, has some very, um, very useful definitions, um, but they also restrict scientific misconduct to the three, you know, the um, fabrication of data, falsification of data, and plagiarism. Why do you think they restrict it to those three when there's all kinds of 
scientific misconduct. Anybody have any idea? I think it's because they're, they're easy to prove. They are, um, they're, they're much easier than some of the other softer kinds of misconduct. And they haven't told me that, but that's just my interpretation. Um, so research integrity is that core set of values held by professionals who conduct systematic investigations. And these are research professionals. I mean, we have research professionals that um, span the entire enterprise, as you know, not just the PI or the, even the co-investigators. We have people, we've all, as PIs, we've probably all had the unfortunate circumstance of someone, or maybe you haven't. Have, has have any of you had the circumstance where you looked at data and it was too perfect and you kind of backed up from there and said, got a little bit more into the weeds about how it was being collected and said, oh my gosh. Nobody, and, has anybody else had that happen? Yeah, I had that happen one time. Um, it, you know, it just it sort of stops you cold. Um, because you have to throw away all that data. That was the most distressing thing to me, is I had to throw away 13 participants who, who, whose data was made up and, and go through all the stuff with NIH, which was no mean feat. Um, anyway, uh, so anyway, this is the most um, widely accepted, I think, definition of research integrity. It, now, research integrity involves both context and process, and I think I've heard every excuse there is, frankly, to hear um, from people who once they, and especially, you know, as a dean, that's one, another position I've been a dean, this is my 11th year, um, when there is any suspicion of scientific misconduct, it usually comes right to that office. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a career stopper. There's no question about that. So you have to be very careful um, when you begin to investigate that. And I can tell you as an editor, every editor has nightmare stories about what authors have done and what they claim to not have done. And, um, and frankly, most of those don't ever get resolved because of litigation fears and well, authors get lawyers involved and all kinds of other things. Um, but the process basically does start at the conceptualization of ideas. And yet in science, if we have to worry about someone stealing our ideas, I just can't imagine how fast we're going to move ahead in terms of generating the next step, generating the next new idea. So this was what I was referring to, um, is that they, they only really count fabrication, falsification. Not that these are any small um, uh, issues, but I think it's very easy for researchers to dismiss that they have ever engaged in these, because most of us haven't. It's a very small percentage, thank goodness, of the scientific community who has actually engaged in those. But if you begin to look at the whole continuum, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we have a lot of other everyday misconduct that we might think about. So these are all the other kinds of um, examples of research misconduct be, beside, beyond, that go way beyond FFP. Um, and I, I would think that any investigator who's been um, honest with themselves and, and maybe even their team would find at least a couple of these that they could um, point to as, well, and, and have some very clear rationale. For instance, a scientific re a selective reporting of results, don't we? You have to be selective, right? You can't report everything you've found. That's not quite the point. It's how you, um, I used to have a, I had a, my PhD advisor many, many years ago said, told me the science was in the outliers. I had no clue what he was talking about as a PhD student, right? Because all I wanted to do was just support those hypotheses. That's all I cared about. And, but he was so right. It was those kids who fell outside those, you know, clusters that really, really pushed you to think about, okay, how come that kid didn't fit the theory that we proposed? And how come that data is so, what is it about that child that was so different? And that's really when you begin to, I think, bring some uh, much more critical thinking than if you're just looking at everybody who fell within the confidence intervals. Um, and these are some other continued. Now, we ha and we have rules and regulations, right? I mean. I got to tell you, I've been at, I have spent five years at UAB right after we got shot, not shot down, shut down <laughs> um, for, uh, for it, it, was, it was traumatic. It wasn't scientific misconduct in terms of the FFPs. This was in 1999, and I was the associate dean for research in the school, and they 
they came through to do an audit and didn't quite find the minutes of the IRB to be to their satisfaction and then found a few other things. I'm not making, I'm not minimizing any of that, but it, we had, we spent six months running everything back through IRB, shut down dissertation data collection, everything was closed um, down. And it is, it's traumatic, it's expensive, it's traumatic. And as a result, they tripled the amount of money that they put into the um, IRB office and the rules became a lot more uh, rigid and a lot more slowed us all down even more. Um, and I think we're, I don't think we've backed off any of that despite the ethics literature around what are we really getting at when we try to maintain research integrity. So why, why do people engage in this? Even if you just stayed with the, the um, you know, the sensational cases of, uh, for instance, the anesthesiologist who made up data for 13 different peer-reviewed um, publications in nine different um, journals. Why, it, to me, it's a lot easier to collect the data, for heaven's sakes, than it is to sit there and make it up and make sure it was different enough from the previous study. I mean, there's got to be some real, um, that's got to be a game. That's the only thing I can figure, is you got to get some real uh, <laughs> stimulation out of thinking about how you're going to do that. When you look back at that very in-depth case, which came out of Massachusetts, what you find is he was a PI first author, actually, on all these papers. His co-investigators never really were asked to, I mean, they read the paper, but you know as well as I do, even as a reviewer, it's really hard to tell whether data was made up, unless it just looks too perfect, and sometimes that uh, sensitizes reviewers. But there were some things, the amount of time that he spent um, getting those papers published was, for most of us, would have been pretty short. So there were some things looking back, but really um, not, there's not a lot that you can, for instance, you can't profile any of these people. They're not all in it for the money. They're not all in it for the fame. It, it just, if you look at the different cases, ethical cases, and analyze them, it's really hard to pinpoint what, what really happened there. These have been some of the studies that have been done have uh, speculated that these are factors. Um, you know, people have to get promoted. So they, although actually in most of the cases, that's not actually borne out. Conflict of interest certainly has in some situations. Arguments about who owns the data, and usually that's between graduate students and their supervisors, is who really owns that data and who can go ahead and publish it. Um, poor mentoring has been speculated as to be uh, a major factor. So we've put in place all these training programs only to find out that that really may or may not be effective. And the latest in this whole series is the influence of ethical climate in an institution. And there's actually Gaddis and Gaddis did some interesting work related to that. And how do you measure that? So how prevalent is this? Is this something we really need to get excited about? Well, if you look at all the different studies, project administrators, um, biostatisticians, some of them actually report higher levels like the biostatisticians, um, you know, but they have access to the the actual data set. So you would expect that they would, and in many cases they have access to the raw data, you would expect that that would be a little bit higher. But the ra it ranges anywhere from like 24% in all these different studies um, all the way to 50%. Now that's the whole range. That is not, I'll show you some data in a minute from a study that was done. The, the the fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism are much, much smaller. And if you look at ORI and what they've done, over a 10-year period in the 1990s, they, that's when they had a fair amount of money, and they actually had 200 confirmed cases of uh, misconduct. Four years later, they found that in, they actually did a no, fair number of investigations where they couldn't really support the allegation of scientific misconduct. And these investigations take a lot of time an awful lot of time to really be fair to the person being um, accused, to be fair to the whistleblower, it really does. But they also saw, and they admitted they saw, in terms of new allegations, um, a 50% increase. And that was, and that's been fairly consistent now in the last um, decade. Uh, these are another few studies that have been done. There's not been any done exceptionally recently. Um, 
and the 17% of the pharmaceutical trials, again, this was about fabrication of data. And it's really interesting when you ask people whether they are aware of an instance of scientific misconduct or whether they engaged in scientific misconduct. So, of course, what you see is we all know about these things, but, oh, of course, we would never have done that. Um, and Martinson and Anderson did a really interesting story, study in 2005 saying, you know, we need to move beyond, beyond um, actually that should be FFP, and, and actually um, surveyed uh, 3,400 NIH-funded scientists and postdoctoral fellow, fellows and asked them about 10 behaviors that were judged to be sanctionable. Um, and here's, I don't know, can you see this? Um, what you see in terms of trend is there is a little bit of a difference between mid-career and early career individuals in terms of what they um, report engaging in. Um, and you, but not, you know, there's not, again, not a lot of uh, the high levels, there's not a lot really high levels of prevalence here inadequate record keeping related to research projects. This is why there's been such a call for auditing actual records and um, was because of the, you know, that almost a fourth of this sample actually indicated that they, when you have numbers of people in a lab um, and sometimes you have a very good lab manager, you'll get better record keeping. I mean, I don't know this personally because that's not the kind of research I did, but it's my understanding talking to people that you get a lot better record keeping if you have an excellent supervisor with all the postdocs, all the pre-docs coming in and out, et cetera, um, and doing studies over and over. But clearly that, um, you know, if we're going to audit things, that needs to be one of the things that we think about. Um, so the other thing I find, and when I'm talking to pre-docs and postdocs, they are, they're, they're most concerned about what if I, you know, they, not what if I'll get caught, but how would I ever prevent myself from getting caught? And they take, I think, too much responsibility on related to this when if one, um, so I talk to them about, you know, this is not about an honest error or difference of opinion. Um, you can have somebody that can accuse you of this and they can either be just, unaware of what scientific misconduct really is. They can have a grudge. They can, there's can be an argument between you and someone else about who owned the data. So there's a lot of things you can do up front to make sure that that's clear. Um, and, and there's a very defined process that even if it comes to the dean's office, a very clear process about what has to be done. Um, nobody is beyond or nobody should be, on, be beyond in any institution being seen as being above scientific misconduct. Nobody, doesn't matter who it is. And there's a whole process to follow, including a committee looking at the, talking with the complainant, looking at all the evidence, hearing from the accused, what they were thinking. It's a very, and that's why we don't resolve these in like two weeks or anything. And what I have found when it comes to my office is the person that's usually doing the complaints is very righteous about this needs to be taken care of like right now. I remind them we're not saving lives in most cases, um, at least in the kind of research that we do. Um, in, in some cases, safety could be an issue and then you'd have to shut it down immediately and stop everything. But just because it's, you know, there is due process here and that this can shut down lives. Um, so the most common um, scientific misconduct report in the literature is related to protocol implementation. There are clearly some external pressures that we need to talk to our um, trainees about and how they can manage those pressures. Uh, one of the things that has yet to be looked at that we found out of our work, and I consistently hear, and I think this is getting worse, is that many of the research coordinators couldn't possibly stay on top of all that they have to do. And an example of that would be, let's say it's a, somebody in an NCI trial. And they are, you know, they're only paid retrospectively in some of these trials um, instead of prospectively and by the patient that's enrolled. Well, it could take, let's say each screening to even see if the patient's eligible takes 40 minutes and then it takes you another 30 minutes to talk with the patient, see if they'll participate. Then they say no. And when two out of the three of them say no, you're only getting paid for one. And that puts a lot of pressure on the research coordinators to do things like, what do you think? 
How could that pressure be relieved? Kind of, <coughs> <coughs> some of you know, say what you think. I, I definitely would agree. Additional staffing at sites is needed. Most study coordinators are just overwhelmed. So what they tend to do on some of the studies is kind of look at the inclusion exclusion criteria. That's one factor that you could use. And you know, there's always a little room for judgment. And so they will apply that. Then the other place, the other point that that can um, that one can exercise some uh, um, influence is whether you want to be in this. Okay, you do meet the eligibility criteria, but mm, oh, I know you say it won't really won't take that long. You know, yeah, yeah, just not. Not lying about the trial, but perhaps soft chewing it just a little bit. Um, and so I think the staffing, I know that the um, national organization was looking at staffing patterns, but it comes down to the money, right? How much is a trial going to pay? How much? And, and the thing that um, I think is an issue is that it is, if something like that does happen, who's at risk? The PI or the investigative team, not the people that were funding it and didn't give you enough money to do it to start with. So it's, it's really important to get a sense of what is the workload. Like what really has to happen to enroll a participant in? How much does this take? How much time does this take? How much skill does this take, et cetera? Um, you know, and this is, this is what um, I had been uh, talking with uh, when I talk with people across the country about this. There's certain, and, and it tends to be the more competitive universities who this notion of idea conceptualization and um, people appropriating ideas, but really who owns ideas? And how do you take an idea and get feedback on it if you don't share it? I mean, that's a, that's a real dialectic that people are going to have to kind of work out on their own. I think documenting early those ideas and um, finding people that you trust to give you the kind of critique that you need. Now, none of us can control that, right, when it goes out for grant reviews. And there's been all kinds of speculation about how that happens and what happens. And there's been a, some interesting literature from the young investigators across all scientific fields. Um, you know, you probably know this, but senior investigators are funded at three times the level of the under 40 investigators. And there's a lot of speculation about why that is and what, what's accounting for that. Um, you know, the blogs kind of take it to a whole new level of honest impressions. Um, that w who, who knows whether that's really true or not. But it is something to give some thought to. Because the senior people are on the grant review groups, no question. Uh, copyright important ideas, figures, and frameworks. And this is... Um, <laughs> This whole notion of open access and copyright and what do you copyright and how much do you copyright if you want to maintain your own idea and whether, frankly, it really matters the way people take ideas and transform them and send them out everywhere anymore. I think in five years, all that's going to be almost close to irrelevant. Certainly, we focus a lot on prote prote um, protection of human subjects. And I have a lot of my own ideas about that. Um, because it's, as, as any of you know who have um, assented or consented patients, uh, it's not about signing the paper. There's all kinds of issues, although I think pragmatically they're important, uh, about what patients in a setting like ours really, they want to know what they're and their provider team really thinks about, especially those who have chronic illnesses. Like, would you, you've probably, if you're a physician you've, or a nurse practitioner, you've been asked, would you put your mother in this study? That's like always a, kind of a backdrop. I don't know how you answer that um, in, in your own mind, but that's what patients want to know. And will they read the 12 pages of the, of course they won't read it. I mean, it's, first of all, it's, as one told me, as one mother told me one time, I am not going to read that. That is just too scary. All I care about is that they find something to help my child. And I thought, you know, you're really right about that scary part. Um, they get one paragraph in, and they just want, they can make their assessment, and they want to know, next thing is, well, what does so-and-so think about me being in this? So, so much for separating therapeutic misconception. And there's a lot of interesting literature about that. Um, but what people want to know, there's also a whole lot of interesting data around 
whether people care about the privacy of their health information. You've probably all seen that. They, frankly, don't. Um, we care about it an awful lot. What they care about is getting better and having a higher quality of life. And if that takes a little sharing of information, most of them are fine with that. Interesting. Data integrity, supervision of research assistants and data entry personnel. Wow, where's the time in the day? This is where it gets, um, you have to find ways to audit. I'm talking as a PI, I'm not talking about the, uh, what do we have these here at um, clinical research unit CRUs? I know we have one of those in our school. I'm talking about the PI has to take responsibility for auditing their team and who's collecting that data and pulling back in, looking at the raw stuff and whatever was completed and really getting very serious because people are under all kinds of time pressures now. And I think the, it's, the, the buck stops with the PI, right? So I just, I, if a faculty member tells me, well, you know, I, I trained that person, they were supposed to get this, they were supposed to do that, well, you know, but if you've never gone out there and really seen what they're facing in the field, then that's your, that's bad news for you. I mean, you're the one who's ultimately held responsible. And analysis of the data. There are some old um, techniques, you know, that um, scatter plot. I mean, you can look at your data. You've got to look at your data and kind of see what's up with that as opposed to just kind of taking it out and saying, oh, yeah. How many of you have been involved in qualitative analyses? Which is a whole separate um, issue, but it, it, there, it's very interesting. Um, what, what you find out reading some of those um, transcripts that we don't really always see from our quantitative data unless you do some of the, you know, real visual, use some of the new visualization techniques. Uh, talking about informed consent, probably everybody's in here taking their annual or biannual, whatever it is here. Um, these are common, you know, again, I, I kind of touched on this earlier, the confusion and misunderstanding about their participation research. I, for, I've been in this for a long, long time, and I'm not sure how, when you, how to really get past some of this. Some of it has nothing to do with literacy, although some of it, um, some of it has nothing to do with education. You can have someone with a PhD in business be reading a consent form about one of our health trials and have come out of there having absolutely no clue what they're really giving consent for. Um, you know, so that's not about literacy per se. It might be about health literacy. And then the whole notion of I just want to get better. I just want my child to get better. And then there's a whole issue too. When we're doing clinical trials, we oftentimes uh, randomize institutions, and this is particularly too in pediatrics with a small number of uh, potential participants in each organization. So you'll randomize a hospital to, or an institution to wash, for instance, T cells um, as part of this protocol for cancer treatment. And the, you know, the informed consent is 12 pages long, and that's like two lines. And nobody really understands what washing, I mean, the investigators do, but the parents don't understand what washing T cells are. And as a parent once said is, there's no, this was an engineer, you know how engineers think, and he's like, look, this is pretty black and white. There is no choice here. What is the choice? We pick ourselves up and move to the Children's Hospital of Minneapolis where they don't wash T cells? Is that what you're telling me? That's my choice? That's actually what we were telling them. <laughs> um, I mean, they could, they could get standard of care, which was, you know, fine, but I mean, if they wanted to be in the study and, as he said, make a difference for other children, that was, they really didn't have any choice over which group they were randomized into. It's kind of, so part of this we do to ourselves, right? We um, have created a research infrastructure that ends up actually making some, uh, or raising some issues and concern. And then there's a potential for coercion between um, the relationship with the providers. And, and this isn't negative, it's just the way it is, incentives. And what I always found was interesting is you walk into some like emergency rooms and there'll be three studies a participant will be eligible for. One pays $1,200, one pays, gives you a t-shirt. Well, that would be a child, right? Give a t-shirt. And another one would pay $200. So which one do you think the parent's going to be the most interested in initially? But we don't ever, I mean, that's among ourselves, right? 
investigators trying to figure out. Now, I think some institutes, some centers have done a nicer job of trying to field some of that so the patients don't get overwhelmed, but others have not done a very good job with some of that. Now, age, and you know, again, we can't, age is uh, not just on this end of the life cycle, but certainly on the other end of the life cycle. And, and in many ways, I think the elderly, as if I'm not one of those, um, actually uh, want to people please more than uh, children nowadays. And now that we have this big bolus of elder care and elderly patients, we have to give some context, I mean, some thinking um, to that. Um, there are people who argue for divorcing the consent process from the treatment team uh, with a neutral disclosure. That's another personnel. It's another cost factor. Um, and again, carefully weighing the amount and type of incentives is critical. There's, there is some guidance about that, but it's very loose guidance, very loose. The only thing it essentially says is you should not ever reward anyone for um, pain suffered that that's not, you know, if there's any kind of pain involved in the protocol or whatever. That's the only real concrete um, guidance. Um, and, and, and reimbursing for actual expenses, trying to figure out exactly what that is. Other than that, um, there's really a lot of uh, variability in terms of how we can do that. So this is the world I live in now, is this dissemination. And... Um, you know, one of the biggest questions is how much do we salami, does everybody know what salami publishing is or sandwich publishing? And that's the big one. You have a great big trial. How do you slice it and dice it so that you still give, you know, you give credit to everybody so everybody can get promoted um, and or whatever the kind of driving factors are. Um, how do you not, it's easy to say we're not gonna do duplicate publications, but there are times when every one of us have, has reviewed for a journal and you'll read the study and you're like, is this all there was? Seriously, like who cares? I mean, it was such a small slice of that study and some authors don't tell you this is part of a larger investigation. That's one of the conventions, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to say clearly that this report is a piece of a much larger investigation, but some people tend not to do that. And you leave that, or I leave that manuscript when I review for other journals, saying, I, who can't, I mean, this is such a small piece that without some other bigger picture, I don't know where to fit it. Now, there's some clear rules, right, about you don't ever, well, I say clear, people break them all the time, but if you have an intervention study where you've had baseline six months, 12 months, 36 months, you're not supposed to report the findings of that trial, right, until 36 months. Is there, that's a pretty common convention. Why do you think that's important? Anybody done meta-analyses or anything like that? <coughs> well, we all know that the findings at three months sometimes look really different from the findings at six months and then look different from the findings at three years. And really the answer is in all of those together, looking at all of those trends across time, not just each of those. And if you do, do them at each of the time periods or two of the time periods are going to be counted in a meta-analysis twice. And that's really not appropriate. But it happens more than. Um, there's everyday ethics, um, and this has a lot to do with, uh, we've all lived these, uh, meaning of data, the rules of science, whatever science you're in. What's the difference between a first author and a senior author, for instance? Um, sometimes gets pretty interesting. Life with colleagues and who really needs a publication. Um, and the pressures of production. You know, if I know I have to have grant going in next year and I know I'm going to have to have a certain number of publications leading up to that, come on, we've got to go ahead and get these out. So those lead to a lot of issues related to author authorship. And those are difficult conversations where power comes into play. Um, criteria that have nothing to do with the criteria put out by the ICMJE group, which is the International um, Journal of Medical Editors. There's conventions about this. You can go to their um, .org site and find all these conventions, but the rules do not include um, some of the things we see all the time. Uh, data omission is, is again, as, as an active investigator, 
trying to do that as honestly as I could without shifting the results in the direction that I wanted is, is left up to each and individual, every individual team. I mean, you just, you know, it's easy to throw out those outliers because they're simply outliers. Or they, there was some reason that their data didn't look like everybody else's. And we really need to give the picture of the truth, you know, all of that kind of thing. You'll hear every excuse in the book. And this issue, again, of duplicate publication, um, without referencing the others, I still, um, and you know, it's a very small world of peer review even now, so that oftentimes if you're a peer reviewer, in a, like mine would be in pediatrics and pediatric nursing, and you'll get a, a manuscript to review from one, and then you get it right back again. Um, and you're like, really? With very little time, except I could, the only thing I could say is it was probably reject without review from the first one, that it didn't even go through the review process, so now we're seeing it again um, at the same time. Uh, abstract proceedings in most disciplines do not count. There are some, um, some unusual situations where that would be true, that they would be counted as duplicates, but for the most part they're not. And I always try to stress to people, it's fine to ask 13 editors if they're sending them your abstract, if they're interested, but never ever is it to send two papers to the same journal. It should be obvious why. Peer reviewers aren't paid. They are usually very, very busy people. They spend three to four hours at least on your paper. And if you submit it to two journals, and I've, I've actually had this, I was at a conference and Somebody said to me, one of the people at my table, unfortunately for her, said, um, you know, I just, I sent a paper to Nursing Outlook and I remembered the name and I said, yeah, actually I just got the last of those reviews and it looks like you'll have some revisions to do. And she said, oh, I don't think you need to worry about that. I already had it accepted. And I thought, and I said, well, I will assume that you are n new to publishing but you have just violated the single most important rule because reviewers spend, this is rude to your colleagues, um, but I also should have said, don't ever send me a paper again. I, I will never forget that person's name, ever. <laughs> so as long as I am editor there, it's not going anywhere. Um, so, but there are still, we have huge data sets and we have huge studies that a lot of people have worked on, a lot of people have spent time and energy in. So it's silly to say that we're not going to have a lot of papers. But just that some thought needs to go into, um, okay, how, what is the research question? What are the findings? Who's going to take ownership on that? How are we going to manage the team? The 15 sites that are part of this study, um, you know, and have that all written down. And the question I'm sure that never occurs to you, but I get asked a lot, is suppose you're on a team of writers and somebody just doesn't do anything. What do you do? What have some of you done? Drop them. Just like that, or? You give them the opportunity to say what they did. And then and, that's it. That's, yep. or, or sometimes I've had to delegate what I want that person to do. Oh, so you give them a section and give them a timeline and then what happens when the timeline comes and goes and nothing happens and you right. cut, right? Yeah, that's really, that gets a little trickier if it's a lab, the head of the lab or the head of the NICU unit or somebody who, you know, there's other things, life just comes in the way. Somebody just had major surgery, but the paper has got to get out. Um, I think it's just those honest conversations like, you know, life happens. We'll have more papers out of this. We would love to have you contribute later when timing is better for you. But for right now, the team needs to move on. And we've sort of had this discussion. So we need to get going. Ghost authorship, is that an issue for... No. Um, does everybody know what ghost authorship is? Yeah. People who write the paper but aren't really considered on the authorship. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is I'm an editor for Elsevier, and one of the um, things that uh, the intent was to a lot of papers, not necessarily in my journal, because we don't have a huge issue with this yet in nursing, but in some of the other journals that Elsevier publishes, medical and science journals, the corresponding author would be the ghost author. 
and submit it for the team and then get it back and manage all the, you know, and check in and out with the team, et cetera. But never was that person on the off. So they came up with a rule that if you are listed as corresponding author, guess what? You know, now that they put these papers right up on your final Word document goes right up on the journal website, like within a week of being accepted, then we started getting complaints. And even I got these complaints only because we sometimes have pieces from NIH, NINR writes a, you know, some kind of piece about a new program, but they don't, the author, the head of NIN, NINR doesn't submit her own paper. She has her, whatever, her assistant do it. And that person's name then got on there. And you can imagine what kind of uh, issue that produced. So, well, it's, you know, it's in the author's guidelines. <laughs> I mean, it's like right there. So the only way around that now, because what they're trying to deal with is falsification of papers. You know, they've had that whole issue in publishing where people were writing reviews, good reviews for papers and submitting them. And then those were published and they were all fraudulent. It was just a mess. Um, so the publishing company is trying to deal with this the best they can. So it inconveniences you as a very busy person, but you're going to have to learn to, you know, just submit your own paper and then that person will not be on it. <clears throat> now, that doesn't say anything about how involved they've been in the writing, but if they've been very involved in the writing, then you need to give some thought to looking at the criteria for authorship. See if they fit those. If not, they need to be in the acknowledgement. <clears throat> oh, I think... Yeah, I think I've touched on most of this um, in terms of the salami publishing, discussing it early on, always referencing the larger or parent study in each paper. Um, and there are times when a, a paper can be published in two issues, two different journals by two editors, but both editors have to know, we have to deal with. I mean, it's not a hard thing. Um, I've done this, but it needs to be worked out between the two journals and who owns a copyright, et cetera. Um, you know, the reality is that, you know, ethical practices in publication, <clears throat> if we don't, I, 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 there have been studies now where evidence-based uh, best practices with patients have been uh, developed with bad, uh, bad data, fraudulent data. And that has, that's, that's really is about, you know, important stuff. It's one thing to pick up a, fraudulent paper and try to build science on it, although that's bad enough. It's another whole thing when you're building best practices and evidence-based practice guidelines and then peak clinicians are implementing them and it's all based, not all, but a lot of it's based on bad um, or data that was made up. Maybe it's not so bad. Um, and so I think ethical practices and publication are critically important. And these are actually, this is just a study that um, was done in nursing, but it's been replicated in other fields as well. And I think we've seen a lot of the problems with the association. Um, the Canadian Medical Association fired the editor and the whole editorial board about 2007 because they didn't agree with what the association president wanted to do. So it was quite a brew. I'm trying to save some time for um, questions. Self-plagiarism, there are people who get upset about that. Self-plagiarism, this is interesting to me came out of the theater literature? Have you, or, or the literature literature like, um, have you ever, anybody in here is a Jodi Picot fan books? No? Well, after you've read three of her books, you're like, okay, I could guess the plot, right? They're all the same. Um, the same thing's true of um, like Arthur Miller plays. Apparently he was really good at self-plagiarizing. What they're talking about is plagiarizing their own ideas, which I think is interesting. I never, I actually never thought about that. Um, but I, how many different ways can you describe a method section? I mean, that's the, that's the issue is, I mean, you just, maybe you move some words around, then the reviewers don't like that, you know, because they want to read everything exactly as it's supposed to be. So what I say to people is, look, the method section's one thing, you know, figure out with your team how you're going to do that. Are you going to publish the methods paper, which is, actually, there's journals now where you can publish your whole trial and not really get into any of the findings, and then you can refer back to that. Um, or do you want to re remove that from copyright? I've let people do that sometimes, knowing that they're actually going to put it in a table in subsequent issues, um, I mean subsequent papers that they 
publish. But really where I come down on this is the part that should never, ever be self-plagiarized is the introduction, the findings, and the discussion. The rest of it, well, the literature is going to be a lot of the same, the, especially the methods. That's, I don't know how you get around some of that, but there's some people who get very, and now that every paper that you submit goes through these um, software packages. So like at Elsevier, when I open up a manuscript, um, before I assign it to reviewers, I can tell you exactly how much, they've crawled the web already, and I can tell you exactly how much of that paper has been um, picked up. And not only that, I can scroll through the whole manuscript and see which pieces of it have, which is very helpful for me because if it's in the method section, I'm not going to get all that excited about it, even if it's up to like 20%. Once you get over 20%, I get, start getting a little nervous about that. And, that's, and as we have a lot more cultures, uh, international authors who have different rules around research integrity and, and ownership of ideas, et cetera, it, it becomes a little more complicated. These are just... So I think useful science must be built on accurate, clear, and honest data. I think we'd all agree um, with that. You can disagree about interpretations, but we, we have to have something that we work from. Um, and in our health professions field, the ultimate protection for vulnerable individuals in research is only made possible by researchers who really, we're all going to make mistakes, but if, if, we, if we believe that we go about this whole enterprise with the highest level of integrity, those will certainly be less. And we're shaping the next generation of scholars. And, and there are, there's interesting literature out there that talks about how it's not your words, but what you, how you behave as an investigator for your trainees that really, really makes a difference. And I know that was true when I was being trained. I watched my uh, professors, you know, do some things, positive things, that um, cost them a little bit. I mean, clearly cost them in terms of getting the amount of data they needed and the amount of time that they needed it. But it was a good lesson, really good lesson. So what kind of questions? Do you have any questions? Or do we fit? Oh, that's right. You have to moderate no, no, no. this part. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for giving us a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. That's very informative. I wanted to know if there has necessarily been um, a surge in scientific misconduct or ethical issues as technology is advancing and um, we're getting more information and data electronically and using mobile health devices, those kinds of things. Hmm. I'm trying to think of why we would expect it. Um, you know, right now, I just actually finished an editorial. Um, I think the last stop for scientific misconduct lies with our reviewers. I think that's the only, um, because we, we have 2,500 biomedical articles a week published. That's a lot. Um, and in some cases, like I just mentioned, the technology helps us, right, to know if the same data is somewhere else or, you know, like sometimes it'll pick up some of the small bits and pieces of tables when I look at a manuscript, but it's often, when I follow it, it's on somebody's report, which, you know, then you, it takes my time because I have to talk to the, you know, author about, you know, make sure they've given proper credit, et cetera, um, but it's understandable. So I, but that's an interesting question. I'm just trying to figure out how that, like with all this big data, I think we're going to identify new issues, new um, things to be concerned about. I think right now we're just worried about can we ask the right questions, and if we ask, well, I'm not sure about the right questions, but can we ask questions that, will, that we can then assemble data in a way to get us answers that we can then drive care? I think that's sort of where we are unless it's changed in the last week. Um, because it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's way too much data in our electronic medical records. And it's almost like the more data we have, I'm working with a team across campus of a thousand people, it seems like, on an NSF project. I'm there because of the ethics stuff. But where we're trying to bring together data sets, this is all about children, from a variety of different places, like the criminal justice system, the health system, the school system, et cetera, and they're doing the coolest thing about simulating data sets and then putting them together. Um, but 
I think that's pretty cut. Apparently NSF thought it was pretty cutting edge too because we were invited to the second round. But it's th those are the kind of questions I think we're going to start tripping over. There are people who say that the days of a one-site data collection clinical trial are over. But I also wonder if 20 sites individual data collection. I don't, I don't know. But if that's true, then a lot of our research um, ethics literature has been based on that paradigm. So where, how do we move into the next one? Not a good. Ross? Uh, has it ever bothered you that we always talk about all of this as a research protection program? Um, I mean, it, it's one of my current concerns is, you know, why is it, who are we protecting? And, and can't the investigator sometimes be operating in the best interest of the class of patients instead of being viewed as a predator of the research subject? Absolutely. I, I, you know, I think it's easy to do when you focus on in, in a consent form. I think that's, you know, it's like FFP, right? It's there or it's not. Um, there's no real uh, attempt. What, which, how could you do it? How could you you know, go to every single patient and validate understanding. But there is, what, what I've watched over the last like 20 years is a total distrust in the investigator. And I don't know where people think they're getting rich from. I, it's almost like we're, you know, that, oh, researchers are getting rich off doing this work. That's, we all know that research costs money. For every dollar that you invest in a health science center in, research, it costs you, or that you get, I should say, and then invest in it, it costs you $1.25, I think, were the latest things that I saw. So this isn't like, I, but yes, it has bothered me a lot. And I, but I don't think anybody understands, it's a wicked problem. I mean, I think we've tried to throw things at it. I think we've tried to, you know, um, say to people this is much more, much, much more than just informed consent or assent. But I don't think we have the man, man or woman power to really address that, and we don't have the level of trust. And yet when you look at the, the prevalence of scientific misconduct, it's so low. It's like we're using a, um, a cannon to shoot at a gnat, hoping we're going to get to those. And yet many, many of, many of the sci scientific cases, scientific misconduct cases that come up, when are they caught? They're caught after publication and have to be retracted. So you're like, wow. So we, we must not, all that consent to auditing and all that other stuff must not be getting at what we need to get at. But that's all I, I have no answers. One question that follows that is, uh, you, know, you talked a little bit about how patients are less wary about sharing data than the institutions that try to protect them from the investigators. Any thoughts on how to move forward as more and more data that could actually help improve care and lives of patients involved in research and clinical care um, can actually move more freely rather than through layers and layers of constraints that actually sometimes are so heavy that the data actually doesn't get shared as a default? You know, I, was, um, I presented in Chicago in the fall, and I have got to go back and pull this. Um, this was a woman who, um, has started, she has a very small, rare disorder um, organization. It was based on something that her a genetic uh, uh, abnormality that her child had. But, and over time she's been an advocate, but as a result is she has now, um, she's on a mission and she's working with other small, rare disorder groups. Because that's who's saying, look, we, we have lived with this for a long time, and we're sharing with each other. We don't care about your privacy standards. You know, you're really slowing us down. Every time we try to get something done through proper channels, which is, you know, institutions, we get shut right down, saying that we have to protect this health information. So now, of course, they're sharing it on websites, on blogs. They're doing surveys of themselves and what they, and you're like, well, you know, and, and, Nobody can say they can't do that. How to get that other than speaking to, because this woman was speaking to physicians and nurses and other health professionals. But other than that, I don't, unless we as health professionals go out and seek some of that out, I'm not. And then you'd be questioned, wouldn't you? Because it's not exactly 
you know, scientific. Uh, uh, it's not our usual way of doing science or adding to science. But I think those, um, you know, and too bad NIH doesn't, you know, they have an Office of Rare Disorders. And it's too bad that, and I know they use some patient advocacy groups, but patient advocacy groups are still viewed very skeptically by those of us in research and science. That it, you know, they're all out for their own message. No, what they're out for is to make progress. And they don't feel like we're making it very fast, for sure. Great. Well, thank you again. Okay, thank you.